Hey guys, what's going on? It's Andy Elliott. Today I'm here with my man, Shauna. This is crazy. This dude has one lung. What's even crazier, see, they say you need two. You don't need two. You just need one. And this dude has climbed every mountain almost in the world, Mount Everest, a whole bunch of other ones, which he's going to tell us about. But anytime that you guys think that, you know, life is, uh, is, is, is limited, it's really limitless. And a lot of you, you have so much more inside of you. and You have more than you need. And I think once I, once you got to where you had one lung, you went and really did some stuff you didn't do when you had two lungs. Am I right? Absolutely. So this is an opportunity for you guys that are ready to push to a new level to get inspired and understand how this man did it. Check it out. I just want to stay bad, stay mad, shit by my shoulder because they treat me like an outcast. I ain't going to take that, stay back. I'll be swinging on until they hit. You want to talk about one percenter? How about a one of a kind? One at eight billion. Sean Swarner is here with us. He is the only person to have done two different things. Survived two different types of cancer, one of them incredibly rare, and the second to climb the seven highest peaks on seven different continents, do a Ironman in Hawaii, and go to the North and South Pole. Yes, except I didn't climb the seven highest peaks on all seven continents, just the highest peak on each continent. Okay. It does sound like the seven, yeah, seven, 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 yeah, but no, the highest mountain on every continent, the seven summits, and then if you include the North and South Poles, that's called the Explorer's Grand Slam or the Adventure Grand Slam. I think it sounds like a Denny's breakfast platter, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't name it. But then you add in the Hawaii Ironman Championship, and there's one person in history who's ever done it. Amazing. Take me to the top of Everest, because this was your first challenge. So you are diagnosed with cancer twice when you're a teenager. You're told you're going to die twice, twice as a teenager, including the second one with the rare type. 14 days. Like, I can't even imagine that. So from that point, you're on the top of Everest. What is it like being up there? What did that sense of accomplishment feel like? You know, I, I think I'm more amazed at the fact that you did your research in sh such a short amount of time and you have all this stuff down. <laughs> I'm impressed with that. That's amazing. Um, ever, I mean, Everest, you, you really can't put it into words. You know, it's, it's pretend you're in a plane and the captain comes over the announcement system and says, you know, we've reached our cruising altitude of 29,000 feet. You know, look out the window and up 35 more feet. You know, that's the height of Everest. Everest is at an altitude where jumbo jets level off and fly. Mm -hmm. And I was up there with one lung. But the biggest thing that it meant to me was the entire time I was climbing, I was on the mountain for about a month and a half. When I reached the summit, I pulled out a flag that had names of people touched by cancer. It was always next to my, my heart, in my chest pocket, as a constant reminder of why I was going for that, that goal. And when I pulled that flag out, wrapped it around the top of the world, it wasn't just me being the first cancer survivor up there. It was everybody who's ever been touched by cancer in the world at the same time sharing that success together. So did that keep you going, that why, that purpose? Because 29,000 feet, you mentioned you have one lung. <laughs> so it's hard enough to do with two lungs, let alone half the lung capacity when the air gets really thin, when you said you were there for a month and a half and you spent 20 minutes on the summit. So how does that time equate? Because you, uh, there's a great quote that I saw that you said. <laughs> I have to find it here. The outcome is worth the trouble. Did you think that in your 20 minutes at the top? You know, uh, what, what went through my mind when I got up there, I, I, I fell to my hands and knees. I wept like a baby because I, I, I climbed throughout the entire night. Uh, we woke up at say 10 p.m., summited at 9.32 in the morning the next day. So we're climbing throughout the night, headlamps on, and there's so many other climbers up there as well. It's like a string of cr white Christmas lights. I mean, it's beautiful. And when I got up there again, it, it made me realize that reaching the summit, reaching the end goal, you learn more about yourself in the journey up there because we talked earlier i was on the summit for 20 minutes it took me a month and a half to mm -hmm. reach the top so I, I i had to learn and force myself to appreciate the journey even though it was miserable sometimes i mean we were at 20 21 000 feet camp two two days two nights i was in my tent holding up the frame of my tent with hurricane force winds now 
that's not exactly exactly enjoyable, but it makes the struggle worth the destination. And to do it with the other cancer survivors and people that have been touched by cancer in mind. Oh, absolutely. So while you're sitting there holding the tent up, right? <laughs> because now, is this the third time you face death? Because if you count the cancers, well, you count this this Mount Everest, you know, hanging on. Like, uh, it's a hurricane up here, and I'm yeah. 21,000 feet up. Yeah, we, I mean, we're not going to talk about the car accidents I've been in. Oh, okay. And, you know, yeah. So maybe the fourth or Death fifth defined. time. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, what's going on? It's Andy. A lot of you leave comments telling me that you need help. Do me a favor. I'm going to tell you the best way to get a hold of me. Shoot me a text message right now. 918-210-0254. 918-210-0254. I'll help you with whatever you need. I got your back for life. Let's get back to the video. In, enough, to, enough times that I've, I've had a brush with death where, you know, we've played Scrabble. I know the Grim Reaper very, very closely, but I'm, I'm also pretty close to the big guy upstairs. Mm -hmm. There was one story you told in your book, Being Unstoppable, that I got a chance to read a clip of, where at one point when you were going through cancer, you had a 108-degree fever, and you had this out-of-body experience. What did that mean to you as you became an adult, as you became a cancer survivor, and as you start climbing Everest, did did all that come into play to, to showcase the strength that you have? I think you can get strength from any source that means a lot to you. You know, it can be spiritual, it can be religious, it could be nature, it could be whatever. For me, it definitely was, going back to that experience, 108 degrees, I remember literally floating out of my body, turning around and seeing my body laying in bed. And then all of a sudden, I, I felt this this hard push in my back. I was like, <gasps> and all of a sudden, I opened my eyes, you know, laying back in bed. And I've always had a different look, a uh, different perspective on religion and God and stuff like that. And we're not going to get too deep into that, that hole. But I've always found that as a a source of power and energy to continue pushing me forward because I was on a, a flight not too long ago. I was t discussing religion with, with somebody and I was like, well, have you fulfilled your life's purpose? And he sat there for a while and I was like, are you still alive? He's like, yeah. I was like, well, then you haven't fulfilled it. So I, I feel that same way about myself mm -hmm. where I haven't fulfilled my life's purpose. I think when, when your time's up, your time's up. You know, I was read my last rites with the, with the second cancer. I remember a man in the cloth, ashes to ashes, dust, dust to dust, the whole thing. And they wanted to put me in hospice. And I look at my mom and my dad, and like, you know, what the hell are they doing? Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not dead yet. But I've, I've used that to push myself further and further and further because I don't want to say I'm not afraid of dying. I am. I don't want to. No one wants to. But when your time's up, your time's up. Mm -hmm. So – Month and a half on Everest, after you visit with the Grim Reaper, <laughs> you somehow get to this point where you're climbing Mount Everest for a month and a half. What about leading up to the month and a half, the preparation that you had to go through? How did you, Sean, let me back it up even further because where did the idea to climb Mount Everest come from? So you're surviving cancer, you know you have one lung. And you're like, yeah, I think Mount, climbing Mount Everest That's sounds a like a good idea. idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I remember my mom and my dad, when we were leaving, um, just near near Florida, I was driving out to Colorado to train because there are no mountains in Florida. This was 320 degree or 320 yeah. elevation yeah, or right. something. Well, the, high, the highest point in Florida is the top of the Four Seasons Hotel in Miami. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. So I'm sure the owner wouldn't appreciate me going up and down the stairwell. <laughs> So I remember hugging my dad, and my Honda Civic was packed up. You know, everything I owned at that point fit in a Honda Civic. So I drove out, and I remember him hugging me, and he whispers in my ear, we didn't get you through two cancers to go kill yourself on a hunk of rock and ice. But my parents have always been there to support me. They're always honest with me, telling me, hey, what you're doing is just absolutely ludicrous. However, we support you. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been... It's been interesting. Um, when I was in Florida, like I said, I realized I, I I had something else that was pulling me to do something bigger. And I did some research and found no cancer survivor had climbed Everest before. 
I was like, if a survivor is going to do it, why not me? And why not do it for the right reasons? Not for selfish reasons, but to give back and give other people hope. Because there's so many people out there who they need to see something's possible and then believe they can mm -hmm. do it. Where I'm a huge believer in the mind-body connection, vivid visualization. I see it in my mind's eye first, and then I know I can do it. Power of visual visualization. Absolutely. And you did this when you were a kid as well, when you got back in the swimming pool after the first cancer, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. So you learned that at 13, 14 years old, and the power of visual visualization, I don't know why I can't say that, <laughs> is what helped you progress. So you take this skill that you start developing at 13. How often did you practice visualization, and how did it come into play as you packed up your Civic and, and drove from Florida to Colorado? You know, it's, 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 it's interesting because – do you know who Calvin and Hobbes are, like the, the, the comic book? Mm -hmm. Or not comic book, the comic. Um, Bill Watterson was the, uh, the, the, the writer. And he had how many different characters in his head, right? One of them was Spaceman Spiff, right? So when I was 13, the visualization started then. I remember laying in the hospital bed, getting my treatment, and I remember being like a, in a microscopic spaceship in the chemo drip bag and dripping into that clear plastic tube. And I remember visualizing and seeing my body laying in the hospital bed, the hospital door over here, the television up here, the window out to a courtyard, and either my mom or my dad sitting next to me in one of those lazy boy chairs. And I also remember seeing myself going into my body through the IV. And all of these little microscopic spaceships were collected in the heart. That was like Grand Central Station, right? Mm -hmm. And then I could, I would literally visualize the the valves of the, my heart beating. And I remember then it was my turn to go. So I was shot out of the heart, and I was going left, right, left, right. You know, going through the these these veins, following on the dashboard, like you know, turn here, go there, go straight, whatever the directions. And I would sneak up on a cancer cell in my mind, mm -hmm. and I would shoot it with. And keep in mind, I'm 13 years of old, course. so it's a little out there. But I would sneak up on this this cancer cell, and I would shoot lasers and missiles and bombs and everything. But they'd be laden with chemotherapy, mm -hmm. so I would essentially be destroying the cancer from inside out. Going through that the chemo, it's not easy. You gained a lot of weight. You lost your hair, 60, 70 pounds, everything. Yeah. Which is usually the opposite of, of what we hear. Like the people that are undergoing cancer, they get real thin. They put me on prednisone, which mm. is a steroid. So I didn't gain the weight because of the treatment. I gained the weight because of the, the steroid they put me on, prednisone, which just made me balloon up 60, 70 pounds. And you were an athlete prior to that. Yeah. So you, you face this challenge. You're putting your body through really what turns out to be an amazing feat. Like anybody goes through cancer and chemo, what your body goes through, and especially if you, you survive it, did it show you what your body's capable of? It and what your mind is capable of. It showed me what my mind was capable of. Because it's amazing how mental being physical is. And when you're trying to do something, this gives up way before the body does. It's just we don't we haven't as human beings, you know, you look at back to caveman society, you know, we've slowly lost because we now have technology to do things for us, we've slowly lost this resilience. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people who go through something traumatic, it builds that resilience in them. So you use your mind to push your body. Because we here at the Elliott Army Fitness Division, we go fitness, right. mental, business. Because they're so interrelated, the, the physical and the mental. Because there are moments when you're pushing yourself where your mind's like, no, no, no. But you're like, no, nah, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. And you mentioned that when you got back in the pool, the race that you won after F your first meter cancer. Breaststroke. Yeah, 50-meter breaststroke. Yep. You, you were talking about the conversation you were having in your head and, and being unstoppable. <laughs> and it's really compelling because mastering that inner voice that you have is one of the hardest things to do because that, to me, is the key to, as you put here, conquering your Everest. Who, who do you talk to throughout the day more than anyone else? Yourself, the internal dialogue. Most people are like, oh, my wife, you know, my mom, my dad, my, my coworkers. What? It's yourself. Mm -hmm. And then how often is that talk negative? 80% of the time? Like, would you want to be friends with someone who is that negative to you? 
<laughs> like, why do you do it to yourself? Mm -hmm. But the the problem is, we've been doing that for how many years? All the all the seemingly mundane decisions that you've ever made or I've ever made my entire life brought me to where I am now, right here, exactly this moment. Most of those people, most people, don't pay attention to how they talk to themselves from the moment their eyes open. They probably think, Ah, man, wh I, what do I have to do today? And it starts off with. <sighs> God, you know, another day. I'm like, oh, God, another day. You know, completely different. But if you don't pay attention to that internal dialogue, it'll either beat you down or build you up. So where did you learn that? Because it's always the how. My first personal development conference I went to, I left and I was like, oh, this is going to be easy. <laughs> I've figured it out. But they don't tell you, oh, no, you got to do the work every day. Right. You got to have these daily habits, daily practices in order to make big leaps. And the big leaks always come when you least expect it. And you've been kind of grinding away for 30 days, 60 days, or years, or whatever. And then you finally have this break, and you're like, oh, that's why I did the work every day. So take me back to going back to from Florida to Colorado. You have this goal, this mission, this purpose to climb Everest, to be the first cancer survivor to do it, all with one lung. And you're going to train. How does that, the internal conversation, push you to help you physically train to be able to handle whatever it's going to give to you? Knowing everything that I've already been through will be more, more difficult than anything that I'm about to go through. And also knowing that, look, looking at how I got through the cancers, it was a little bit of chemo, a little bit of chemo, a little bit of chemo, obviously eating healthy, exercising, everything else. But knowing that consistency was more important than intensity. Mm pushing myself a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow, a little bit the next day, and more today than I did yesterday, more tomorrow than I did today. And it was the same thing with, with uh, training for Everest. I, when I moved to Colorado, I moved to a place called Estes Park. Mm -hmm. Beautiful place. And in my backyard was literally Rocky Mountain National Park. And the biggest mountain there was Long's Peak, 18 miles round trip, 14,256 feet. And I slowly worked my way up to carrying, once a week, 100 pounds of rocks in my backpack to the summit wow. and back. But it wasn't just, hey, it's, it's like when you go to Everest. You don't show up at base camp and all of a sudden, <laughs> you, know, you make it to the top. <laughs> I'm ready to go. It's slowly moving. But knowing that, again, what that destination meant to me and why I was doing it. All those little pieces add up. Yes, the, the, the negative thoughts are there, mm -hmm. but you have to realize the thought, one, two, three negative thoughts don't determine who you are as a person. It doesn't define who you are. It's a temporary state. Not facts. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I coach clients to, be to speak better publicly because a lot of what we see when it comes to that is people get on stage and they get nervous. But that's when the prep kicks in. So if you prepped enough... You can manage the nerves or the negative thoughts. Or if in you your just case. don't care at all. Yeah, or you're just like, <laughs> whatever, I'm just going to wing it. But, you know, you knew, so I'm, gonna, I'm guessing. So you get to Everest, and you've done all your prep, and you've done your daily task, and you've managed your mind, and you're carrying the 100 pounds of rocks up a 14,000-foot peak. Did you get to Everest feeling confident? Or did you look at it and go, Shit. 29,000 feet. Yeah, that's probably what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you get to base camp, it's 17,600 feet. Mm -hmm. The mountain's 29,000 feet, man. You get there, and you're like, Shit, this is a big mountain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. But at the same time, what am I going to do today? You know, th th that's a, a long, distant goal. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do today to help me get there? And it takes a month and a half. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, go, all right. I'm going to do this in a month and a half. Did you have like a strategy of, okay, day one, I'm going to try to get to here, or is it just, I know I got this time allocated. I'm going to do whatever it takes, and I have a plan and a strategy, but, you know, like battle plans, they go great until the first right. bullet is fired. <laughs> got to base camp, and the, the crazy thing about when you get there, so the locals believe the mountain is a goddess, mm. right? They call it Chumulungma or Sagamartha, which means mother goddess of the universe. And you can't climb up the mountain until you have a llama, which would kind of be the equivalent of a bishop in Catholicism. Mm -hmm. right? So you have a llama who does a ceremony to ask permission from the mountain to go. 
And I had done all my research. I got my body in shape, got my mind in shape. And when we got to base camp, that was the first time I ever heard of that. So I leaned over to my other, my Sherpa friend, and I was like, you know, what if the, what if the mountain says no, right? Yeah. Rejected. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, Sean, sorry, denied. <laughs> and he, you wanted spending, to be yeah. the first. Not today, but. <laughs> Tough luck. <laughs> and he goes, well, it happens all the time. But what happens after that is you get a new llama, you have a new ceremony, and you pay that llama more money. And we're talking like an extra five or ten bucks, right? So after that happened, after we got permission from the mountain, then we had a schedule in place. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Andy. A lot of you leave comments telling me that you need help. Do me a favor. I'm going to tell you the best way to get a hold of me. Shoot me a text message right now, 918-210-0254, 918-210-0254. I'll help you with whatever you need. I got your back for life. Let's get back to the video. We went from base camp mm. to, to camp one. We would go up with a full backpack, come back down with an empty backpack, shuttling things up the mountain, right? Always coming down with an empty backpack, taking more stuff up. So it did two things. It would help us establish different camps up the mountain, but it would also help our bodies acclimatize. Mm. So going into altitude, there's, there's less oxygen. So because of that, the body adapts by developing and growing more hemoglobin and red blood cells. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal how the body can adapt. So we knew that we would do this, and then we'd come back down, and then we would rest. It could be a day, two days, three days. It's, it's very similar to when my body was going through the, the treatments for, ca- for the, the, the cancers. You know, I couldn't go back into the hospital day after day after day after day because the medicine would kill me. Mm-hmm. If I continued up higher and higher and higher in the altitude, it would kill me. So we would come back and rest. It could be a day, two days, three days. However our bodies adapted, then we would go up a little bit higher and then come back down. So that was the schedule until we were at Camp 3. We're like, okay, let's come back down, put some weight on, eat, rest, get our bodies hydrated, and then go for the summit. So you have to be adaptable. Absolutely, yeah. You can't be a type A personality and be like, I'm going to control the weather. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. Unfortunately. (laughs) No. Some of us do. Like, oh, come on. (laughs) We just want some sunshine today. But you have also, you know, you're talking about going into high altitudes, you know, knowing that your capacity to, to take in air is not the same as, say, mine with two functional lungs that I haven't even ruined with smoking. So <laughs> you, what kind of challenge did you, you know, know in your head? Like, all right, I'm going to have to do this knowing that I have what some might call limitations, but as Andy said in the intro, that's not really how you approach life. You don't approach life as in, I'm limited because I have one lung. I'm still going to go do this at Everest. It, it goes back to what I learned with, with the chemotherapy, you know, going through the treatments. It, people often say when you ask them, hey, how you doing? I'm having a bad day, right? In my mind, I'm like, I'm having a less than ideal day. You know, I never put things in a neg. I try to never put things in such a negative light. Mm. You know, I, I try to spin a positive version of whatever's happening to me where did the idea to keep going after everest come from because you get to everest how old are you when you when you reach the summit 27 so you're 27 years old like three years ago yeah i mean (laughs) simple and then three years you've done crazy things since (laughs) then you've been nonstop. (laughs) so where did the idea to, to 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 go and you know what i did this one there are six more continents with highest peaks on each of those continents well let's go do those yeah i think A few months after coming back from Everest, I forgot about all the shitty things that happened, how horrible and miserable it really was, and I remembered all the good stuff. I was like, let's do it again. (laughs) There there are two types of fun, I think. There's like type A, where you're on a roller coaster, like, woo, this is great, this is fantastic. And then type two, in the moment, you're thinking, man, this sucks, this is miserable. But then you get home, you're like, yeah, it was kind of fun. So I think I... Afterwards, I, I forgot all the, the bad stuff, all the, how frigidly cold I was. You know, I couldn't feel from my knees to my toes going up for the summit wow. push. Um, couldn't breathe. All the bad stuff that happened, I forgot about. But then I also heard of this thing called the Seven Summits. Seven peaks, seven continents. And because I had a flag of, that had names of people touched by cancer on Everest, I'm like, well, why don't we continue that and literally wrap the world in hope? And you kept adding names, so new names that different were added flags. to each flag, right? Different flags. So different yeah. flags, different, and different names. names mm-hmm. yeah. So what it, 
Did Everest? How did Everest prepare you to do the other ones? Because obviously, you think of Everest, you think that's the hardest thing. Oh, the rest that were downhill. Do. I mean, I was gonna say, <laughs> this is not nearly as bad. So, but still, to you still have to travel. You still have to stay in shape. Mm-hmm. You have to keep your mind sharp. Walk us through that because I think that that Sean is one of the most difficult parts. Is you achieve a goal, and oftentimes you're like, "What do I do now?" Right. And you got to keep challenging yourself and keep pushing yourself. And if you start at Everest, you have to figure out, okay, I was able to do that. Now what else can I accomplish? Because I, I think that oftentimes going back to that the personal development space is they tell you about the end. Mm-hmm. And you've been named one of the most eight inspirational humans on the planet, which is pretty awesome yeah, because of what you've done. Yeah, my mom voted on that. I think. Well, that's good. She, you know, she's just <laughs> clicking. Like, oh, give me the website. I'll just click it 100 times. I got this. But you, how do you compel people that you work with that the end goal is there, but it's the things that you do in between that get you there that really matter because that's that grind that I don't think most people are prepared for and I don't think most people want to do. What is what is the ultimate end goal for every human being? We all have an end. Mm-hmm. Who's in a rush to get there? Not me. <laughs> Shouldn't we all slow down and enjoy what we have? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know anybody who's in a hurry, minus some other people who really don't value life as much as we do, but I don't know anyone who's in a hurry to get to the grave. Which is a good thing. because Absolutely. I, I've, as I got older, I hit 45 this year, and I started to think of time differently over the last few years because if I'm lucky – I've lived half a life already. Yeah. If I get to 90, that's exceeding the average. That's pretty good. So maybe I have 30, 35, maybe I have 45 summers left. What do I want to do with those summers? What do I want to do with those years left? And I find that, Sean, slowing down and taking things in and just enjoying even challenges that pop up. And I say, I get frustrated. I'm like, why is this happening? And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Why don't you just enjoy this? Chill out. It's not going to be easy. But you're alive. Yeah. And, you know, having faced death, how many times total, you think? Uh, God. <laughs> uh, more than a cat's life. Yeah, more than cat's lives. I imagine it gives you an appreciation for living. To go back to your point, you wake up every day, oh, God, it's going to be the best day it's ever. Best day ever. How did you get to that point, to be able to convince yourself to believe when you wake up, you're like, I am going to kick this day's ass. <laughs> let's go back to the second cancer when I was given 14 days to live night after night, after night, after night, I was terrified to close my eyes because I didn't know if they were going to open the next morning. Mm. Now let's say that goes on for a year. Every single day, your eyes open. You're like, this is the best day ever. I got another one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even now, I go in once a year for checkup because no one's ever had Hodgkin's in Askin sarcoma before. I get my blood work done, you know, sometimes a CAT scan, mainly just CBC platelets, blood count, stuff like that. Um, and it, all, it always comes back good. I see it as another year to live. Day by day, month by month, year by year. You know, and, and one of the things that really helped me put that in perspective on, if you want to, grab a sheet of paper, draw a horizontal line across it, a vertical line here, vertical line here, Write down the four-digit year you were born, add roughly 80 to that, and put that number there. Figure out where you are on that line, and now you have a visual representation of your life. And you're like, what have I done in the past? Nothing you can do about that. Mm -hmm. How can you change the past? How can you adjust to make the most of your future? And this great advice for someone that might be 23 that's watching you, someone that's 45 like me, or someone that's 65, because it's about the time you have left that matters. So how do you coach people that maybe are middle-aged and aren't happy with where they're at? How do you say, okay, draw that line, now focus on where the dot is now versus that 80 where you're going to be? How do you get them to change habits, beliefs, so that, they can, like you, understand what's possible. I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> because we will talk about this later. It's 
it's called the Big Hill Challenge. It is a three-week mental wellness challenge. It starts off with a root assessment because you need to know where you are before you need to know before you know where you're going to go. And there are a lot of core value assess assessments out there. You know, I've seen stacks of, of cards where you pick out your top five, whatever. That's great. Now you know what they are. That's where it usually stops. I couldn't find what I was looking for, so I created it myself. I took out 60 of the top core values that I could find that I thought would help other people. And what I do is I have people pick out the top 10, and then they write them down, and this is where it gets really cool and eye-opening. On the next page, you rate how you're actually living that personal core value. And now you have a visual representation of the top 10 things that mean the most to you. And if you're honest with yourself, you can see where you're lacking, where you're, where you're succeeding, and where you want to put your energy and attention to build yourself stronger day by day. And that's a great point because, like, for most of my life, I, I've been diagnosed with depression twice. I battled that demon for until I was, you know, in my late 30s. Mm. I just couldn't shake it. Because I didn't have the skills or the tools or the techniques. But what really changed is when I was finally honest with myself. Because I used that as an excuse. Of course you made that decision. You're right. depressed. Of course. You don't believe you're good enough. And when I finally decided that I still made those decisions and hurt the people I love the most, that was when I finally had that wake-up call that, oh, okay, I can do something about this. So you say on your book, Sean, Conquering Your Everest. For me, that was mine. My mental Everest was, was overcoming that. But it came down to being honest with myself fully, completely, and just taking ownership of that and saying, it doesn't matter what you did because mm -hmm. you already did it. And as you just pointed out, you can't undo it. It's about where you're going to go now and how you're going to learn from that so you don't do it again. And maybe you can teach others as well, which is, which is what you're doing. So let's, let's just talk about a couple of these words here. So communication is one that stood out to me that for myself and others because that's that most important thing we talked about. So when you're climbing mountains hmm. or carrying a 150-pound a sled on the North and South Pole, which you dragged. I saw a video of you dragging a Jeep also. You had a <laughs> rope around your waist. You're, like, out there training. It was in neutral. <laughs> it was in neutral, <laughs> yes. But you're still dragging a Jeep, man. Come on. So what's going through your mind, and which one of these values relates to, to pushing yourself in that capacity, which most people don't like, you know, I'm going to carry the sled. So I got to go run down the street with a Jeep on, on my back. That's, that's a great question. I don't see crazy on here as a value. Well, there you go. You can um, add that one <laughs> for the next printing. Of uh, the Big Hill challenge. I would honestly say personal growth. Mm. You know, w one of the things that my parents taught me when I was uh, in it, I think it's in the book. We talked about swimming the, the 25 meter breaststroke, eventually a 50 meter breaststroke. But when I first started swimming, I would swim across and I would touch the wall. Mom or dad would pull me out of the water and they would ask me one of two questions. Did you have fun? And did you do your best? Not, hey, why didn't you beat Jimmy? Why didn't you beat Scott? It was, did you do your best? And if I could answer those two questions, did I have fun? Did I do my best? Absolutely. Okay, great. Be happy about it. Mm -hmm. But going back to personal growth, the next weekend when I was swimming the 25-meter breaststroke, I would do everything I could to beat my time from last weekend. So I never had to be the best. I had to be my best. And Competing with yourself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So also in that same video, there probably, you probably saw, saw me dragging tires. I started off with two tires and then three tires, you know, and then four tires going up Everest. You start here. You slowly go up, building yourself up to it. And people who want to go from here to here, it doesn't work. It's like a house of cards. It's going to collapse on you. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're trying to do something crazy like, ah, Go see where Santa Claus lives at the North yeah. Pole. <laughs> or you might die. Well, and that's you keep doing these things where the the face of death is really there. Like you're in temperatures 80 below. 80 below zero. So what does that feel like when you're 80 below zero and you're like, I got my skis on. <laughs> I'm carrying this sled behind me. What's going through your head there? What, what personal growth are you doing? <laughs> it not, there? not much. Your brain starts freezing <laughs> at that point. <laughs> like it turns into a slushy. In all honesty, it's, and I, I mean this in the best possible way, 90 degree north looks very similar to 89 degree north, right? A hundred some miles away, right? It all looks the same. You know, it's boring. 
mountaineering is boring. There's there's a reason why they have you know climbing. That's my excuse. Uh, yeah, it's boring. It's boring. <laughs> I don't want to do it <laughs> because it takes so long. There's nothing sexy about mountaineering. People say, oh, you know, climbing Kilimanjaro is sexy. You know, it's it's uh, romantic, not sexy, romantic, right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing romantic about spending a, a month and a half in a tent not showering. You know, I, I hugged my mom when, when, when I was coming off of uh, Denali, which was uh, uh, the last of the seven summits. ESPN was there, there doing a thing. And I remember hugging my mom, and she goes, I could smell you before I saw you. <laughs> right? There comes Sean. <laughs> I recognize that B.O. anywhere. No. God. It's my baby. Yeah, but – what goes through my mind, literally for the North Pole, about three miles out, I was counting my steps, and I kind of went inside, mm. and it was almost meditative, you know, meditating on it. So for Everest, I had a mantra. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I told you, I, today's the best day ever. I had a mantra going up Everest. With every step, I told myself, the higher I go, the stronger I get. The mm-hmm. higher I go, the stronger I get. And again, in my mind, this is going to sound crazy when I say it out loud, and I, maybe I shouldn't. But I'm picturing this this conveyor belt in my body, in my in the marrow of my body, making red blood cells and hemoglobin. Like it's going down, you know, it crunches crunches up the cell wall and then it injects things in the middle. So my body's adapting here. But what goes through your, it, so many things can go through your mind. It's like, hey, don't fall over there because you're gonna die. Another. Yeah. Death face. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sean. I like death. At least to stare at it and wave at it. I pretend. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you – you use that in your everyday life. And physical fitness obviously is incredibly important because you can't do any of these tasks without it. So obviously at the L.A. Army Fitness Division, that's what we believe is that when you take care of your body, mm-hmm. your body will take care of you. And you've proven that. Numerous times, whether it be the Ironman, the North Pole, the South Pole, the Seven Summits, your daily life, you're going on a hundred mile bike ride just for fun, you know. Well, like it's no big deal. You know, I wouldn't define it as fun. Okay, but good. yeah, go, I'm glad. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say you're definitely crazy. No, so you, you talk to me about that and how that the physical fitness aspect of it and how your daily approach to that is really what pays off that allows you, despite what some would see as limits. Again, going back to to one long. But that physical fitness helps you carry through. So how important is it? So if I'm trying to become a one percenter or a one in eight billion like you twice, how much physical fitness, how much should I pay attention to my physical fitness? For me, it depends on what I'm training for. Uh, So, for example, if I am training for Kilimanjaro, take a group up there every year as a fundraiser. I've been up Kilimanjaro now 24 times. And I know how to train for it. I'm not going to hop in the pool and swim laps until my arms fall off. If you're training for the New York City Marathon, you're not going to go hop on a a stationary bike and ride until your legs fall off. You're going to train specifically for what you're trying to do at that end goal. So mountaineering, I'm going to go hike up some mountains, Mm -hmm. which is why I left Florida to move to Colorado. But I'm not always that laser focused i mean i'll sit down on saturday afternoon watch college football and all of a sudden a bag of potato chips disappear i don't know how it happens they're just gone Mm -hmm. it's like poof disappear but for the most part again i i I eat i try to eat healthy wake up do yoga every day have a 30 minute yoga thing my wife and i wake up and we do together Um, if i'm training for something then yes i'm focused if i'm not training for something i kind of gain some weight Let's put it that way. <laughs> Natural, right? It happens to all of us. But that's interesting because one of the posts you have on Instagram is really like a five-step process to be able to complete a task. One is set goals that motivate you. So talk to me about that. How do you motivate yourself to keep going after all that you've accomplished? Again, knowing it's, it's not about the destination. You know, it's enjoying the process. I love working out. I love the endorphins that kick in. I love how I feel when I'm working out. Even if I feel miserable, I know I'm doing something good. Mm-hmm. But going back to Kilimanjaro, I, I know I can make it. You know, this, this July will be my 25th trip up the mountain. And it's no longer about the challenge. It's about sharing that with other people. So it's very similar for me. It's very similar to, say, Christmas. You know, I don't need anything. I don't, I don't want any gifts. I, I'm, I'm fine. You know, I appreciate it. 
you know, thank you so much. It's, it's amazing. But I love seeing my nephews and my nieces' eyes light up when they open a present. You know, giving them something. It's, mm-hmm. it's awesome. I love it. It's very similar to taking someone up Kilimanjaro where they step out of the hotel, they look up, and they see the glacier on top of the, the peak, and we're 200 miles south of the equator. And they're like, are those clouds? Right? Mm-hmm. And I call that their oh shit moment. <laughs> so they go this from- This is real. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh shit. And I enjoy guiding them from their oh shit moment and seeing that transition that they go through to the summit where everybody's in tears. You know, the waterworks, the emotions just come out of every pore. And I can see in an instant someone's life changes. That's the joy I get out of doing what I do. And that's why I train, not for me, because somebody asked me, say, uh, you know, hey, I'm going up Kilimanjaro with you. What do I need to do to train? I'm keeping an eye on what you're doing. There's no way I can do that. Yeah. It's like, well, you're training for you. I'm training for me and you and you and you and you. So what I get out of it is helping other people. You know, even let's just hypothetically say you get to the top of Everest by yourself or whatever peak by yourself, whatever goal you want to accomplish by yourself. Yay. Self high five. If you have a team helping you out, you're pulling each other up, you're Mm -hmm. grabbing each other up, you're pushing people up there. You do it together. I have never made it to any significant peak by myself, the cancer, the the mountains, anything. That's important to note because we have a support system, need a support system. And I was just listening to Arnold Schwarzenegger's got a new book out called Be Useful. And he's talking about at one point people describing him as a self-made man. He goes, mm. well, yeah, maybe, but along the way I've had help. This person helped me here. The fact that I moved to America was big. I couldn't do what I did in any other country. So it's having that recognition that as accomplished as you are, as accomplished as I am, yeah, this person gave me a break here. And hired me when they, I was a no nobody, twenty five year old, or you know this person reached out to me after I was fired and said, yeah, we'll we'll work something out here. Hmm. So you had that second life, and sometimes I think our ego gets in the way. It's like I'm great. They're like, no, 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 yeah, maybe, maybe so, but these other people were there too. Yeah. So when when you're thinking about showing cancer survivors what is possible, is that tying into a goal that motivates you. So if you saying, look, look what's happened to me, and I'm just going to go test myself to show other people that they can do the same thing. It doesn't have to be the same climb Mount right. Everest, but whatever your Everest is. So going back, what was the what was the question in there? Yeah, it's about using yourself as a cancer mm-hmm. survivor to show others what's possible. So when you are in those moments where you're like, oh, my God, why am I doing this? Do you think about that to keep you going that next step to get you out of that rut? A- absolutely. When I do visit hospitals and I talk to the survivors or, or the patients, I'm getting some, some inspiration from them because they're literally tooth and nail fighting for their lives. And when I'm climbing the mountain or I'm going to the North Pole, South Pole, whatever, I can always pick up the satellite phone. You know, I have travel and rescue insurance. I can say, hey, I'm done. You know, I'm not feeling it. The mountain's been there for eons. Mm-hmm. You know, it'll be the next year. Someone who's fighting for their life, they can't pick up the cell phone and say, yeah, you know, I'm not feeling it today. They don't have that option. So I, I hope that by me climbing, you know, they're getting some inspiration from that because I'm sure getting some, some inspiration from them. So maybe there's a circle of hope and this circle of inspiration with this, this reciprocity of, of encouraging each other what is that meant to you to be able to encourage someone else to keep fighting something as awful as cancer or to keep climbing something as awful as everest it's it's meant that's a great question it's meant that i've been giving people hope i think because the human i've i've been thinking this for a long time. The human body can live for roughly 30 days without food. The human, roughly, the human condition can sustain itself for about three days without water, but no human alive can live for more than 30 seconds without hope. So if I'm giving hope to somebody else, it's, it's all worth it. How do we take that hope and apply it 
to our lives, no matter where we're at. Because I imagine for you, Sean, you have a structure. You have an approach to your day, which you mentioned. You have an approach to your physical, your mental, to be able to accomplish those things. And that's what I find in studying successful people and people that do crazy things like you, the one in eight billion that are able to accomplish these great things. They have a system of living, I guess I'd call it, that they go back to day after day after day after day that allows those big breakthroughs. Every three weeks, personal core values. Every three weeks. So every do it three, constantly. It's, it's, it's in here every three weeks. And also what is amazing is how many people, when they wake up in the morning, grab their phone, they turn on the news, they get inundated with this negativity. Mm-hmm. When they go to bed, they're on their phone, they get inundated with this negativity again. You know, bookend your day. You know, start off with your, your brain is like a computer. If you don't program it the way you want it to be programmed, it'll be programmed for you by external factors, external forces. So if you're not careful, that negativity will inundate your brain. And it's your, your thoughts are very akin to a glass of, of water. Let's say dirty water represents negative thoughts. Clean water represents positive thoughts. Let's say you have a glass of dirty water. You hold it underneath a spigot, and you constantly flush in clean water. What's going to happen? Positive thoughts, mm-hmm. right? Clean, clean glass of water. So you start your day with an affirmation that goes back to one of your personal core values. So now you're starting your day off with an intention of doing something to support what matters most to you. And then at the end of the day, what I always do is, if even if I don't write it down, my wife and I will share them with each other. Write down, as opposed to being negative, oh my God, I have to do this tomorrow, I have to do that tomorrow. If you went to bed with an attitude of gratitude, you would sleep through the night like a baby. And I don't mean like waking up every hour crying, but I mean like <laughs> right through the night. So write down five things you're grateful for, right? You, you know that happened that day. So you know you're already g- grateful for your health, your, your, your family, stuff like that. That's a given. But write down five things that happened specifically that day and then journal about one of them. I'm most grateful for blank because blank. And that connecting word because helps it link it helps you link it back to your personal core values. So now you're going to bed with an attitude of gratitude. You're thankful every, for everything you have as opposed to looking at all the things you don't have, wishing you could be different. You're going to bed with knowing what you have, attitude of gratitude, and you're waking up in the morning with an intention and an affirmation to start your day. The book ended, right? With Absolutely. That positivity, like you said. So how do I sign up for the Big Hill Challenge? Where, where can I go to get more information that's on that? Easy, that's easy. What's it called? The Big Hill Challenge? <laughs> dot com. Mm-hmm. BigHillChallenge.com. <laughs> so it's a great way to start because, again, oftentimes, this is not what we're taught in school. We're not taught about core values not or how our minds work and how our, I like to say, our minds play tricks on us. It's always trying to talk you into doing bad Absolutely. stuff or believing that you're not good enough or whatever. So that brings up another question. I, I My personal theory on that is, you have like your fear brain and your ego brain, and they always compete, hmm. especially if you start to get some success and your ego is trying to talk in, oh, I'm the man, and then your fear voice is like, mm-mm, you ain't good enough. So you have this, this competition. Facing all the things that you have, Sean, how do you manage fear? How do you manage your fear voice? How do you manage that fear feeling? Yeah, that's interesting because I, I call it the gremlin. Right? <laughs> Feed it after midnight, and you never know what happens. <laughs> it's a great exactly. I don't want to get them wet either. <laughs> the gremlins over here chirping, "Hey, you know, you're not smart enough. You're not strong enough. You're not whatever. You don't have the education. You, they're going to laugh at you. Whatever it might be, you're going to fail miserably." I think that in my past, that voice was there from my mom, my dad, whoever it might be, a parental figure saying, "Hey, be careful," and it comes from a loving place. Mm-hmm. They're trying to protect you. But now that you're older, you still have that gremlin chirping in your ear. Don't do that. You're not smart enough. You're not strong enough. So what I did was, and again, this goes back to the vivid visualization and picturing things. Again, this is going to sound crazy. I named my gremlin. He's Cooper. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Sounds so nice. Right? It's my friend Cooper. So Cooper, and whenever Cooper rears his ugly head, I'm like, dude, stop. So I, I go back and I pay attention to that internal dialogue. And I'm like, Cooper, cut it out, man. Like, look, we both want what's best for me. Let's work together to make it happen. You know, I know in this, I don't do this all the time, but once you realize that gremlin, whatever you want to call him, 
uh, was there to protect you at some point because he loved you or she loved you, whoever, you yeah. know, as your parent, they still do. Mm-hmm. And they still want the best for you. Why are you holding me back from getting it? Can you use that energy to help motivate you? I'll use Tim Grover as an example, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant's coach. He talks about using the darkness and how he really worked with Kobe was, you know, Kobe obviously got in some trouble when he was younger. Well, it says take that energy and use it towards becoming a better basketball player. Can you use Cooper and say, all right, Coop, we're going to work together, like you said, and I'm going to use that energy that comes into my body to fuel me to take that next step. Absolutely. <clears throat> when you get anxious, when the and I mean like the you, um, when the human body gets anxious, what happens physiologically? You start breathing through your upper chest. You start <laughs> shallow breaths. Your hands start to sweat. Your temperature rises. You might have some ringing in your ears. Your ears get red. Your pulse rate starts to go up. Your mm -hmm. beats per minute. Now, what happens physiologically when you get excited? Your respiratory rate goes up, your pulse goes up, your hands start to, it's the exact same thing, physiologically. So if I feel that and it's happening to me and I'm going for a summit or I'm scared about something, I'm like, again, paying attention to the internal dialogue. I'm like, look, take a deep breath. I'm not anxious, I'm not scared, I'm excited and I will flip the script on it. I love that because that's going back to that internal communication, that dialogue Absolutely. that drives all of our decisions and our beliefs. So that's what I want to ask you about too is, is your beliefs. So the cancer seemed to almost shred limited beliefs for you because, all right, I survived it once, I survived it second, and in this book, Being Unstoppable, you, you talk a little bit about the internal dialogue that started, like, why am I going through this cancer? And then the second time, wh why, God, why, why are you doing this to me? How did you start to turn that around to be able to apply it in this way, in the, this Tim Grover, Kobe Bryant, into this Sean way? <laughs> you know, I, I think I, I sat there for such a long time. Why me? Why me? Why me? You know, and then why again? Why again? My God, like, what didn't I learn the first time that you're sending me through this again? And then I realized there's nothing I can do about the fact that I had cancer. That was a fact. Nothing I could do about that. I couldn't do anything about the situation. I couldn't change it. Nothing. That was out of my control. What was in my control was how I reacted to it. Mm. And I told myself, look, there's nothing I can do about it except to change and control how I react. Because you can control, you have a choice in every situation you're in to choose how you want to react. So you can have the flight or fight, you can do whatever you want to, but you can always choose in every situation you have a choice in how you want to react. And I decided that I wanted to choose one that was more positive more of an outlook of, of growth, more of an outlook of living. You know, I mean, for crying out loud, I was 13 the first time, 15, 16, 17, 18, my teen years. Like, I wanted to live. All mm -hmm. I wanted to do at that time was be normal. Like, I was probably the only kid who wanted, who wanted to be in school at that time. You know, so all I wanted to do was be normal, and I wanted to just flip it around and do – to focus on what I could do as opposed to focusing on what I couldn't do. So flipping that script and realizing, hey, this is exactly, I'm going kind of going off subject here, but I wanted to, that's good. <laughs> but I think that what you're getting at is in order to become, you know, a one percenter, these are the exercises you have to do, and you, you mentioned and you, basically— and you can't do it like every other day. It no, has to be every day. Exactly right. So one of the things I work on is communication. So I work on that every day. Every interaction that I have, I'm like, did I say it the right way? Could I have said it a little bit more clearly? Even if I'm interacting with someone at a store, like a clerk or a cashier, I'm always trying to think of what's a funky question I can ask them to see if they'll go with me. And, and you know, you find that you can build rapport with people quickly if you do things like that. But it's that constant practice. And I think if you commit to that, and you even mentioned that in your goals, is you know be consistent in your fourth way that you put that, is that commitment to doing this. Because that is 
you know, you, you notice a big difference when you don't even notice it. You're like, oh, oh, I did change. Oh, I did make progress. And, and I think that that, to me, always seems like that big gap. Like when you give your, your keynote speeches, you spell out, you know, all these accomplishments, how to do it. It's just, okay, you got to commit to doing it every day. And there's no real shortcut to that. There's no way around that. So how do you coach people to go through that to be able to maintain the practice? Again, it goes back to your personal core values. Like, why are you doing it? If you have a deeper-seated reason for doing what you're doing, you're going to not feel like you have to do something. You do it because you want to do something. So if you have a, that underlying meaning and the reason behind it, you're going to have a deeper purpose. Mm -hmm. So what's next for you, Sean? I mean, you've done things that no one else in the world has done. <laughs> You've beat cancer twice. You still have one lung, but you're still out here chasing dreams, accomplishing new things. Where are you going from here? Well, I recently got married. I've heard that's pretty difficult. Um, it can be. It's just, just right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't always have no, to be. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's great. I, I love Julissa, and we've, we've been together now for five years, so things have been going great. Um, obviously, that was a joke. I know. I'm as a married guy, I know. Okay, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, we've only been married for five years. Feels like two underwater. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Biggest challenge of life, but worse than <laughs> right. no. More challenging than Everest. More challenging. <laughs> Kilimanjaro, twenty-five times. Yeah. A uh, hundred-mile bike ride this weekend. Uh, I'm looking at doing a ride across America. It's called the Ram, which is race across America, uh, bike race across America. Doing that in maybe June next year, 2025 potentially going back and trying Everest again without supplemental oxygen. You know, but the, the biggest thing now is using the information and knowledge that I've gained from the cancers, from doing what no one's ever done before, to help other people. You know, I want to pull other people up and help them believe in themselves. You know, I, I can see what people are, are, are capable of doing. And maybe they don't see it themselves. They just need that little boost of confidence or maybe a swift kick in the butt. You know, yeah. one of the two. Yeah. When I, I just got back, I told you from a month long yeah. journey in Europe, and I'm looking at these sculptures and these paintings and these buildings, and it reminds me of what a human can do. And to go back to your mm -hmm. team, like you look at something like the Duomo in, in Florence, yeah. which took like 500 years to build, but the detail is immaculate. It is so spectacular. That can be anyone's life. The difference between, say, a Michelangelo or the people that built the Duomo is they just did it. Right, they paid attention to the details. They fine-tuned everything. To me, that's what it sounds like. Mm. You do, Sean. Do you agree? I, I am very detail-oriented, but I also see the entire forest uh, because of, of everything that I've been through. I'm very fortunate to be able to see different perspectives. I've I've been to seventy countries. You know, I've been adopted into a local tribe in Africa. I've been adopted into a tribe in, uh, not a tribe, but a, a group of individuals in Nepal, like the, the Sherpas. So they call me Dawa Dorji Sherpa. In Africa, they call me Mzungu Gicha. So, yeah. What does it mean to you to be able to accomplish all of these things and inspire other people, even myself? Well, I appreciate that. It, it means my life's not done yet. You know, like I said, I haven't fulfilled my life's purpose. Well, my time's up, my time's up, and I'm going to continue living everything uh, every day to the fullest until my time is over, until, my, until I finally hit my expiration date. Mm -hmm. you know, and I want to encourage people to take advantage of the, the dash that we talked about before, take advantage of that lifeline. And you can get started with the Big Hill Challenge. It's you proverbial. Learn. You don't have to yeah. climb any mountains. You don't. It's <laughs> just your own mental <laughs> mountains, right? It involves your physical, it involves your mental, and it will get you right. So go sign up for that. Learn Sean's method. Read his book, Becoming Unstoppable, because you certainly are. Sean, thanks so much for being here and sharing all this knowledge with us. Appreciate it, man. It's an honor. Hey, guys, I just want to tell you, you're the true one percenters. You made it till the end of the video. Do me a favor. Share it with the friend that wants to go to another level. Make sure you like the video. Comment below so I know who you are. Set your notifications and then subscribe to the channel. We got daily sales training videos dropping. I'll see you soon.